Well, <clears throat> look, there's a lot of speculation and, and hype about the presidential election. So, um, you know, what's ironic is the faces have really not changed that much over the years. I mean, 2014, it was Poroshenko and Timoshenko. Uh, ironically, what brought down the, uh, the first Orange Revolution government was a conflict between Poroshenko and Timoshenko. So we still seem to be in this, this paradigm uh, 13 years later. You know, right now, if you look at the ratings, Timoshenko has the highest rating. Uh, however, that's, uh, that's no mandate. I mean, that's no huge endorsement. She's, she's got 15 in one poll, 18 in another. Uh, I think one poll put her at 23, although uh, the, the methodology might be a, a little bit suspect on that one. Um, but look, I mean, she's in the first place, but she's in the first place among, uh, you know, a, a group of, uh, you know, Let's say let's just say there's no giants in the race. There's a, there's the equivalent of political dwarfs. I mean, there's a lot of little uh, parties and candidates that have you know five percent or six or seven, but there's nobody out there with thirty percent of the vote. So that's the big difference. Um, <clears throat> for Timoshenko, uh, you know, she's been prime minister twice. She would like to win the presidency, and whether you like her or not, you have to admire her tenacity and and she, her determination. I mean, she never quits. Uh, she's probably, it's fair to say, the hardest working politician in Ukraine uh, on the Ukrainian political scene. So she's uh, given it another try. Uh, she lost the presidency to Yanukovych in 2010 uh, by about 3%, 49 to 46%, close race, uh, but by all accounts, a fair race. Uh, the OSCE, all the international organizations uh, said the, you know, the, the problems with the election were minor and, and did not affect the outcome of the results. So uh, Timoshenko is making a comeback, uh, and you know she's uh, doing that primarily through populist slogans. She has billboards all over the country about a new people's constitution, a uh, a, uh, a new course for peace, kind of uh, reminiscent of uh, Richard Nixon's secret plan for peace in Vietnam in uh, in uh, '68, uh, and um, and and a new course for Ukraine, so a new economic course. So those, those are her three uh, billboard themes. Uh, she's restyled herself. Uh, the uh, the uh, the pony the uh, uh, the ponytail is out, and uh, instead she's gone with more of a uh, I would call it a uh, television journalist anchor look. Uh, so she's uh, trying to project uh, a more intelligent, uh, a smarter, wiser look uh, than uh, her previous. Uh, images have, have done. So she's definitely given it a good run. Uh, she's got some support of some of the oligarchs. I mean, Kolomoisky, for example, uh, he, he and Poroshenko have been in conflict for some time. Uh, and uh, he's also from Dnipro, and he's been an ally of Timoshenko at different times in the past. So uh, she's got support of, of, of him and others. Um, she's a formidable candidate, I mean, by any means that you, you look at it. Um, Next, of course, is the president. Uh, the president is pretty much where every other Ukrainian president has been at this point in their term, and that is the ratings bad uh, because they found out it's much harder to be president of Ukraine than it seems. Um, <clears throat> and let's keep in mind, there's only been one Ukrainian president that was ever reelected. That was uh, Leonid Kuchma against Petro Semenenko, a communist, in 1999, and he did that uh, by uniting the international community. Uh, using a lot of administrative resources, uh, but in the end, he won uh, somewhat comfortably in, in the runoff. Um, ironically, that's pretty much the same formula for Poroshenko to win a second term. He's going to need to get, uh, uh, say, the, the maybe not the administrative resources so much, but the powers. He's going to need to maximize the powers of the incumbency uh, in a way, uh, not in the blatant way that, that Kuchma did, but uh, just in an intelligent uh, uh, cohesive manner that uh, maximizes uh, his resources, maximizes his appeal. Uh, and I, th I would say he could do that. I mean, I, I always use the example. Uh, when I first came to Ukraine in May of 99, I saw a poll that was that post in the key post. And at the time, it showed uh, Natalia Vitrinko, uh, the, uh, uh, the ultra Marxist, uh, at 20%. It showed uh, Petro Simonenko at 11 and Louis Nguyen Kuchma at 9%, he was running third. So you can make an analogy to where Poroshenko is now. 
Uh, but I mean, polls at this point don't matter. I mean, they, they were, were uh, quite a ways out from the election. Um, a lot can change once the president starts to uh, put his campaign in motion. He's making some of those steps with personnel now. Um, and so he's, he's in a much stronger position than President Yushchenko was at this point in his reelection. Um, and uh, he has potential to repeat the, the Kuchma formula of uh, maximizing all of his resources, getting into the second round, and then winning in the runoff. Um, the key for him will also be that to make the election about the future and not the past. I mean, a lot has changed in Ukraine over the last four years. Uh, you know, whether it's the visa-free regime, uh, whether it's a thousand days without buying Russian gas, um, you know, energy independence, uh, whether defending Ukraine's sovereignty and, and territory. Uh, all those are important issues and things that have changed dramatically in the last four years. You know, Poroshenko uh, has played a role in all those. Um, uh, in, instituting the anti-corruption agencies. Yes, of course, he, he probably personally isn't a big fan of those agencies, but in the end, they did, they did come into existence under his watch. Uh, and so they will function and, and continue to exist into the future and hopefully become effective. Uh, in their work. So those are all things to his credit. So if he can make the, the election about the future, he has a chance to portray Timoshenko as the past, uh, which would play, uh, which would hit a chord with voters. Uh, there is a lot of technical assistance coming in. Pretty much by definition, they make that as non-political as possible. Uh, and uh, they uh, put, certain, put certain strings to make sure that politicians don't uh, abuse that for too much benefit. Uh, but that being said, you, you hit on something important, and that's the international community. And, and what does the international community want? I mean, um, right now, for example, there's a debate with the IMF. Is the IMF going to give another tranche or not? And this plays right into the, the, the presidential election. Uh, because if Ukraine gets the next tranche, it basically, it'll get them through the presidential election. Uh, if they don't get the next tranche, then Ukraine uh, is at risk because the national bank reserves uh, are only enough to cover about three months of, uh, of uh, trade exports, uh, import exports. So that puts Ukraine in, in a bit of a risky position. Uh, and uh, we've already seen the currency slipping a little bit. It's up to 28 to the dollar, to the U.S. dollar, that is. Um, and uh, people say probably looking at 30 by the end of the year. Uh, so if Ukraine can get that tranche, uh, that would be beneficial. But what the IMF has been demanding is that Ukraine raise gas prices again. Uh, and the Prime Minister has been very strong in his opposition to this uh, because of uh, they've already raised gas prices once. It was, it's, there is a lot of anger about that. And even though six million Ukrainians are getting subsidies to help pay their, their gas bills, it's still it's a huge, huge pocketbook issue. Um, and uh, you know you do subsidies, but you got to go stand in line, fill out the forms and all that kind of stuff. So it's not a, you know, it's not an online process with two clicks of a mouse. Um, so there's a lot of fear if they raise gas prices again, it will further erode the president's popularity, uh, maybe make him un unelectable. Um, and so there's a, a, you know, a certain point there's a debate within the IMF though. Uh, how, how much do we want to hold this government's feet to the fire on the gas prices, uh, which could potentially sink this government, or, uh, and, and, and as a result, then we, you know, that throws the election to Timoshenko, who historically has played on populist themes and, and been, uh, let's say, uh, somewhat aggressive to the IMF. So you get a, you get a government that's worse, uh, has a worse relationship with the IMF. Uh, there's a question of how do you get paid, the IMF gets paid back the money that's owed to them. So it's really a catch-22 for uh, the IMF. Uh, how, how much do they want to pressure the Ukrainian government? So that's why I believe you're seeing a, a bit of a compromise. Uh, the delegation's gonna be back in town uh, later this week uh, to, to assess the situation. Uh, the Prime Minister proposed eight different solutions, uh, eight different compromises. So it I, looks like uh, there, some sort of compromise will be reached, uh, which will, um, how to say, take some of the pressure off the President, uh, while at the same time not uh, tanking his reelection. Well, look, the land, the land market's a huge thing. The IMF's been calling for it for a long time. Uh, I remember, you know, President Yushchenko was a big advocate of it as well. And, and as we've talked about on, on, on your program here, um, you know, you don't fully grasp how important that is until you, you take the very practical example of you're a farmer, 
how do you buy you know seed for for planting? Well, you got to have it in your pocket because the bank's not going to loan you money. Why? Because there's no ownership of the land, right? So you can't borrow against your land, uh, and that's a key issue. So that makes it uh, very very difficult uh, to uh, to be successful in business when you can't borrow against your own property uh, like you would in any other country. Unfortunately, uh, one of the lingering legacies of of communism uh, on Ukraine is this. Uh, mindset about land and of course there's, there's reasons for it I mean uh, let's not forget people still have images of the uh, the German army putting the black soil in train cars and shipping it back to, to Germany during the Second World War so that image is still ingrained in people's minds so unfortunately pretty much any question you ask about land privatization even if you say it's land privatization uh, only with Ukrainians not with foreign entities and so forth uh, you know you're you're a at best going to get about 30 percent support. There's very strong opposition to it. Now that may change after the election. Uh, by the way, Timoshenko has been extremely outspoken in, you know, uh, against privatizing land. Uh, it's one of her populist issues she's used. Uh, would, would that be different if she was elected? Who knows? Uh, but uh, there's, there's no indication of that. He's, she's been pretty consistent in her, in her rhetoric over the years. Uh, so that's a concern also for the IMF. Mm -hmm.